Hello and welcome. I'm Rosemary Pena, president of the Black German Heritage and Research Association. Our conversation today is the first in our fall 2024 event series in collaboration with our students at Davidson College. My colleague, Dr. Emily Frazier Rath and I are especially delighted to open this semester's classroom discussions with our very special guest, Mrs. Carmen Geschke, who in addition to being a founding trustee of the BGHRA is also someone whose friendship I've cherished for many, many years and whom I affectionately consider my sister. As it is our custom, however, before we get started, I'll ask Emily if she will kindly share a little about our work together before introducing and turning the conversation over to Carmen and our students. Emily. Hey, thank you, Rosemary. My name is Emily Fraser rath and I'm the Executive Director of Education Initiatives for the BGHRA. Thank you very much for being here for our first conversation of the academic year, or of the, sorry, of the real year, 2024. I'm, um, I'm also a visiting assistant professor of German studies at Davidson College, where I co-teach our course entitled Race, Gender, Migration with Dr. Pena. Today is February 8th, 2024, and we, Dr. Pena, me, and most importantly, our students, are in our fourth week together in our German 241 class, again entitled Race, Gender, Migration. This class is conceived of in three parts. It is first a survey course in the field of Black, German, and European cultural studies. Second, it is a community-based learning course as we support the BGHRA through our work and will feature our final projects on the BGHRA archive. And it is most importantly, an opportunity for students and through these recordings, our broader BGHRA and Davidson communities to speak with people whose lives and work are at the intersections of um, artistic expression, resistance and activism, identity, among many other things in modern day um, Germany, Europe and beyond. For making today's conversation possible, I would like to thank my colleagues in German studies here at Davidson, as well as Stacey Reimer, the director of the Center for Civic Engagement. The Center for Civic Engagement has been a steadfast and supportive ally in Dr. Pena's and my 30 years of running our co-taught classes, this being the sixth. Without Stacy and the Center, many of these conversations archived in the Black Germans YouTube archive would not have been possible. And for making it possible, we are forever grateful. So before turning things over to our students and our guests, Mrs. Carmen Getschka today, I'd like to take a moment to formally welcome Carmen to our virtual classroom. Thank you. Carmen Getschka is the president and owner of ProTech Inc a company based not too far away from us um, in Davidson in Greer, South Carolina, as well as being um, a trustee and founding member of the BGHRA, among many other things. And so I will leave that there to allow for you all to have a great conversation together. And um, I'll turn things over to you, Carmen, and to you guys, our wonderful students. Thank you so much. So my name is Carmen Geschke. I'm honored to be here. I'm very excited to be with you. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, as Emily said, I live in Greenville, Greer, South Carolina. Um, Greenville is a beautiful, beautiful city with lots of international influx as we, uh, we host the, the only or the largest BMW plant outside of Europe. So therefore, about 14, 15,000 people are employed directly by, B by BMW, as well as 50 or 60,000 by their suppliers here in the area. Also, we have Michelin headquartered here, in the only headquarter in the US. So we have a considerable uh, French influx here. So it's, it's quite an international community here, and I'm really, really loving living here. So I came 
to the United States, immigrated to the United States in 1999 with my late husband. And the love to the country brought us here. We had been in the States many times before on business and or uh, pleasure. And every time we came, we felt like we really want to live here. So 1999, we had the possibility to come here and we lived in Michigan for the first three years because we came with, um, at the time, Daimler Chrysler. Um, then my husband got an offer down here from a supplier and we moved down south. And I could have never imagined to live in the south. I didn't even want to take vacation in the south because I thought, hmm, I wonder, I wonder. But let me tell you, it's just wonderful. And I personally have not had any incidents whatsoever. So um, to my business life, my husband and I, we started a company, Protec Inc. in 2004. And for the first four years, we did primarily rework. So you have to understand if uh, the big companies order, plat order parts in China or India or wherever, they always have to be reworked or rejected. And still that is cheaper than have parts made here in the US or in Germany. So we had the research, the uh, WeWork company, maybe about 25, 30 people. And by 2008, when the big recession came, everything just went away. And um, also I lost my husband, but then I went back to my own skills, which I have done all my life. Um, I have a master's in accounting and business management. And so I, build up, we built the company as HR, payroll, in accounting, which is what I'm still doing today. Some of my clients are, most of my clients are smaller European companies, primarily German, um, such that have here maybe a technical office or a sales office or whatsoever, um, but outsource the administrative side of their business. I work from home, COVID made that possible. So, you know, now I have a home office and I'm happy, happy, happy here. Um, so that's part of my business life. Um, my sister Rose and I, we go back very, very many years to my beginning years in Michigan. And we kind of felt sisterhood by the way. On the way, we adopted another sister, that's Gisela. I think she might be coming to your place one time also. And the three of us, we just formed a wonderful friendship and sisterhood. It's just, it's just awesome. So in Michigan, we attended a um, business event and some person, I forgot, a young man said to me, you know, um, there is a group of Black Germans in Detroit. And uh, that is, believe it or not, that is the first time I heard the impression Black German. Because there was no word like that in Germany, at least not known to me. And, you know, I lived most of my life in Germany, so somehow I should have heard it. Anyway, so I got in contact with this group, long story, but through this group, I also met Rose. So that's the best thing that could have happened. Um, on, on the volunteering side for my life, for many years, maybe 10, 12 years, I was uh, a member and board chair also of the YWCA. The YWCA is uh, eliminating racism, racism and empowering women. And that's my thing. That's totally my thing. I, you know, I want women to be strong, empowered and ready for life. Here I'm on the board of, of a uh, organization that is called CVMSDC. It's the Carolina Minority Supplier Council. And on the board are minority owned, certified minority owned businesses like my own. And I 
and, and people from the big companies like from BMW from Michigan. So we all get together once a month on a board meeting in, and I do that since about 10 years and we come up with ways to teach MBEs, to empower them. Uh, so just a small example, when BMW first came here, minority business was something they did not even understand what it is. And, you know, they said, yeah, 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 we, we support that. But really, there was nothing. So today, BMW requires from every of their big suppliers, like Bosch, like Siemens, and so on, that they spend 5% of every order to a minority-owned business. And it's tracked if that particular company does not spend that much on minority owned, they will lose the contract. So that has a huge, huge influx on companies here and you know the well-being of the people. I think I've said enough now about <laughs> me and my life and my background. Uh, maybe I forgot to say I'm um, I was born in Stuttgart, Germany, the southern part of Germany, and I'm here since oh, about 25 years, and I love it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the intro. Um, in preparation for today, students also watched um, uh, the panel you were on at the BGHR conference in 2012 called Witnessing Our Histories Reclaiming the Black German Experience, where mm -hmm. You were featured along with Kavina King, who is the BGHRA Vice President, and Lara Sophie Malago, who mm -hmm. we actually had um, speak to our class last year. Okay. Um, and of course, um, moderated by Tina Count, um, whose right. work we occasionally um, include in class. Uh, so um, some of the questions that students have might be coming from that. Others, um, we've also looked at your LinkedIn page and other things like that. <laughs> so okay. um, just just to give you context. So um, any anyways, um, anyone want to begin with a question for um, Mrs. Getschke? Savoy, it looks like you wanted to. Maybe not. No. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to pull up my uh, written down question. Okay. And it's only in my email. Um, how are you able to balance your position as the president of a company and be able to be an active member on so many different uh, boards of activist groups because yeah. you've talked about positions in multiple different companies on different boards and as the president and founder of your own company and so i'm just wondering how you find the time to be able to balance all of your different efforts um that's a good question sometimes i wonder myself how i do that but i'm very good in delegating so you know, I always like a team around me wherever I am, whether it's my business or it's my organization. So we can, as a team effort, do things. Also, I have to say, you know, it's it's a matter what you prioritize in life. My company is very stable. I've done accounting all my life, so it, it's not stressful. It's just good work to, you know, uh, it's relaxing work to me because I love to work with, with numbers. Um, except when it's tax period and it's kind of, hmm. But um, then I prioritize and say, you know, what is the most important thing to me? And mostly it's, you know, what I volunteer on because I see so many young new starts companies that have no clue what to do. They, they just have no clue. They, you know, they think they have an idea and $500 and off we go and we start a company and and I give you an example. I talked to a lady not long ago and she said, I make wonderful soups and I want to sell my soups. Okay, so, you know, she cooked and she made soups and she got containers 
and and now she's delivering soup. Now reckon the soup for three dollars forty. You have to take it to a place. You have to take your time. You have to have all the ingredients. How many soups in a month do you have to sell to come up with, I don't know, two thousand dollars net in your hand? And that is what I like to help new people with or new uh, startup companies to my uh, minority supplier development council. So they have a ground to start. More questions? Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. I had a question. It's kind of a, a general question, but um, how has like growing up in Germany changed your perspective, both kind of in the business world and just in general in South Carolina? Because I'm around here too, and so I'd like to see that or to hear about that. Well, you know, growing up in Germany, I would have never thought I have a business of my own. It's just not that easy like it is here. Here it, in the States, it's made it easy for you. You have lots of support. In Germany, that is not the case. And then remember, I'm a black German, which, and I'm born many years back. So um, that was not easy. And that was not on my book to have my own company. Um, when I came here and when I came to Michigan, I learned very quickly that you can have a company here and you know that you can make a difference for yourself and while my husband was employed you know i've i was employed too but i was thinking i'm gonna have that company for me and when we came down south um honestly it was not all that hard the, the doors are open um they are open for women there is also a an organization uh, where women get women owned businesses get certified or veteran owned businesses and minority owned businesses. So I can, you know, I can be for both minority owned and women owned. And if you're active, I mean, if you're actively going out and get the information and meet the people, then you can do it. So do you live in the South Carolina area? I'm from Charlotte, but I'm very familiar with South Carolina. I get okay. out there a lot. So okay. North Carolina, but, right. you know. Yeah, but Charlotte is a ble beautiful place to be. I mean, I'm very oh, often- Oh, it is, it is. I'm very often in Charlotte. So the questions y'all came up with, because I knew that y'all would be kind of nervous today, this being our first conversation, um, really kind of spanned two two separate realms, right? One was um one one group of questions was about Carmen's business and um being a businesswoman in the United States and so on and so forth. And the other sort of group of questions had to do more with um, what she was talking about on the panel conversation about um, identity and that sort of thing. So um, maybe right now we can stick with those of you who have questions regarding her business, and then we can expand the conversation later to include um, the other ones. So, so anyone else have a question regarding sort of um, Carmen's business life? Don't want to call y'all out, but I do have your questions. <laughs> if any of you want to start a business ever, you can just contact me and I'll help you out. Yeah, we have a big mix of students here. So we have 24 students in this class, and I think we have a lot of economics majors, poli sci. Um, 
let's see, we, we have some sciences, right? Biology and so on, some history, that kind of thing. So a large mix of people. That's um, nice. Yeah. So we have um, a question coming in. Some students would prefer to not be recorded today. So this okay. is a question from a student. Um, what are your ideas for continuing to involve diversity in your work as you expand your business even further? Diversity? Yes. Yes, diversity. So I think yes, I got it. The um, AI kind of thing, you know. Yeah. That could be my middle name, but I'm also very, very clear on you have to have the skills, you have to have the attitude, and and you have to come to work every day. Um, I, I do not hire by race. I hire by skills. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I cannot afford to have somebody uh, and that person is a person of color and, to, and I hire that person and then it's working out, not working out at all. So do I look for diversity? Most, def most definitely, I always look to have a diverse workforce. Now, today in my life, business life today, I only have two employees. But before, like I said, we had 30 or so. Um, but still, I look to have a very diverse workforce. And I mentor people. So if maybe I hire somebody or I know somebody who might need mentoring or would even ask for help, that's what I do. I've mentored during my business life quite a few primarily women uh, to, to have their skills so they would have better skills. Since nobody is talking here in this house, um, diversity is a big theme. It's, um, I have friends uh, who have consulting agencies like, you know, where DEI is their only um, purpose to have that. Um, some of my clients ask for, um, people to come in and do a workshop on diversity, on racism, on eliminating, you know, racism in the company, because occasionally, you know, something comes up and, and then like, I talk about a plant uh, and then people come up and say, you know, he's a racist, blah, blah, blah. And, and you have to, you have to educate your workforce. So that's what, what I'm, trying to help, I don't do it myself, but that's where I'm trying to help out and put um, counselors there or put people there that can speak to racism or other work, workplace related problems. Do you have more questions coming in? <laughs> <laughs> for such oh. great questions you all submitted you're pretty shy to ask them there was one question about um the german car industry and this person had um just did a project in one of their political science classes about the german autom automotive industry automotive. okay and um is wondering about your intersections with the German car industry um, and how it ties back to your own identity as a native of Germany. So what are some of the possible, um, or so, sorry, what are some of the positive or negative aspects that you've experienced while remaining in business uh, with a company from your home country? And furthermore, how has your identity as a black German 
woman played a role throughout your upbringing and journey in the business world. So a lot, a lot there. It's a lot, right. I don't think my identity played a role in, you know, starting the business or, or running the business. However, I'm quite a bit, you know, at the BMW plant because number one, there are uh, council members from, from the Minority Supplier Council that are at BMW. I have friends there. Um, and sometimes I find the Germans, if they don't know me, and I say something in German, like, Guten Tag, um, they would go like, well, maybe not that strong, but I can see their surprise that a black woman can speak German. And um, But I don't think it's a problem anymore. It, it may have been different 20 years ago, but in today's world, uh, BMW is pretty open and um, women-friendly, minority-friendly. Um, they provide a lot of information and also a lot of benefits, of course, uh, for people. And they play such a huge role in, in our uh, economy here. I mean, you can imagine how much money comes in when you know, BMW is there and our airport, we have a beautiful, beautiful, small airport, but it's called International because we fly the engines from BMW from Munich to here. We don't fly people, but it's still international for that reason. Um, everything else usually goes out of Charlotte. Maybe read the first half of your question again. I'd like to add something to, to that question, though, Carmen. Um, the, your German language skills, what role did that play or does that play in your ability to create relationships or, you know, at least in the beginning with your right. business in that area? I think it still plays a major role. Um, two years ago, so BMW has a huge, huge event every year. Um, where they invite all of their suppliers. So there are thousands of people and, and the minority business owners. And two years ago, I didn't go because of COVID. I'm, I'm a bit careful. And so, um, so BMW had made an, a video with me and one of my customers. And they played that video during that whole event. So, you know, but I wasn't there. So later in the afternoon, I got a call from a German, German guy, German company. And he said, well, you know, we saw your video. And mm, since you speak German, um, and we looked for somebody to do our accounting. So that's how I got some business, you know, with people knowing I'm here, I know what's going on here, but I'm educated in Germany and my language of course is still German. So that's how it, that's played a major role, role uh, in, in that regard. So anyway, I'm doing their accounting today, but also them and me have founded a minority business owned business where I, you know, since I'm minority owned, I have to own 51%, but hey, you know, opportunities come your way and you have to take them. I don't think I ever told you about that. No, but there is something else that you told me that you didn't talk about in the video that I'd love for you to share. Um, how about the experience of you becoming a minority owned business with your German passport oh that was um <laughs> that was a bigger chaos <laughs> uh, i think that's your interesting story so i have i have an american passport by the way rose um because in order to be a minority certified business you got to be a u.s citizen but that was not my reason to become a citizen but um i had to prove that i'm black 
Now, remember, that's about 20 years ago. So DNA and stuff like that was not, you know, readily available like today. So um, that made me think in Germany, I was never white enough. In the States, I was not black enough. Um, you know, I had to do all kinds of stuff to get a DNA to prove that I'm African American German, which is what I am. Um, another little thing, because you mentioned passport. When my husband and I in 2006, when we applied for US citizenship, we had to go to Charlotte to the FBI and, you know, fingerprint, background, whatever. Even though we already had filled out 10,000 forms, you still have to do that. So you were called up to a terminal where, you know, a person would type in your information. So he typed in all my information and what, and he spoke. He said like, okay, Carmen, and then he said, oh, race, white. I said, no. And then he looked at me and he said, all Germans are white. So to this day, if the FBI looks for me, I'm a white person. And to this day, I don't know, should I cry or laugh about that incident, but I will never forget it. I was wondering, Miss Carmen, um, I had a question about, since you're in South Carolina now, um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of still being in business with companies back in Germany? And what do you miss most about um, Germany? My family. And that's about it. Uh, you know, I love Germany. Germany will always be my home. Um, we have wonderful food there. But um, I love being in the States. I love living in South Carolina. And... Um, so I'm not missing a whole lot. I was there last year in June for about 10 days and I go on a fairly regular basis. My friends are coming over. So in today's world, you know, with Zoom and Teams meetings, it's it's not as bad as it was 20 years ago when you had to watch, watch your telephone calls. And what was your question about South Carolina? You You answered it, thank you. All right. All right, let's open it up to any questions you guys have, including about the video, um, which was, what, 12 years ago now? Mm -hmm. um, still so much pertinent stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. much. Um, how do you think the FBI viewing all Germans as being white relates to the idea of the BGHRA and does do you think it correlates with the need for the existence of organizations such as the BGHRA oh absolutely absolutely we have to we have to share with the rest of the world that there are all kinds of people all shades all colors and like I told you you know I'm, I'm not sure I still today don't know if I'm mad at, at this guy because he looked me in the face and he said, all Germans are right. Or should I just laugh because he was so ignorant. And you know, that might be just that one person, but somehow, somehow I think people are just a, a bit na narrow-minded. So organizations like ours, which is, a great organization and, and most does such a beautiful, wonderful job on it. Uh, and my minority supplier development, I think they are very, very important to educate people, to, you know, to get together, to talk, to be on the same table, to learn from each other. Oh, 
Um, so a question I had on that was, um, you are in two, you have two major facets of your life with being a business owner and being a part of the BGHRA. And I wanted to know if there were any things that you learn being a part of panels or educating people on the B BGHRA or things you have learned being a businesswoman that have helped you in the other and uh, vice versa. Hmm. That's a good question. I can answer part of that. Okay. Your business acumen is responsible for the BGHRA existing. <laughs> so you had to mentor me. So that's one way. That's <laughs> one really way. That's right. That's life. going one way. And that's a very important way. And you, that, you still play that role. We don't have any money, but you still so, play that yeah. role that is in, in, in documentation. So it definitely does. And I think that one of the things that is important for our students to understand, and this is a perfect opportunity, is that you know, like you talked about the language skill, that's part of your being a Black German, but what does that mean? You know, yeah, right. what does it mean? What does that mean, you know, in your life? So I think that uh, mostly what the BGHRA is trying to bring to light that you can't encapsulate any group of people in any way. That's one of the important reasons why we brought you here today. I think actually you might be uh, our first business person to, okay. uh, to present to the class, which is important because even in terms of language skills, right? This class is taught in a language class for German studies and people mm -hmm. wonder why take German, okay? Right. Especially living in the US. And you've just shown students in a German class how important it is through the BGHRA, right? You wouldn't be this class if you were. Right, that, that is absolutely right. That's absolutely and right. And now you, you've allowed, you've educated students close by, what, an hour away from you? That if they learn German in whatever capacity, there are opportunities for them. In yeah, business. absolutely, yep. Absolutely, opportunities. And, um, you know, in going back to the original question, the BTHRA helped me to learn that identity is very important in business. So I sort of built my identity. I'm, I'm a, a businesswoman, not necessarily a black businesswoman. I'm just a businesswoman. But today, I do not have to belong to, I, I don't need a label anymore. You know, I don't want to belong anymore. I, I am who I am. I'm proud of my business. Um, but besides that, I'm just Carmen. I wanted to ask a question kind of about that. Um, it's something that you mentioned both in the panel and like earlier in this meeting about how you hadn't heard the term like black German until you mm -hmm. moved to the US and found people of like a shared background. So I guess sort of on just what you were saying, like what is the importance, if any, of like kind of labeling that identity and like sharing in that label? Or do you think it's kind of just like a more surface level way to like make a connection with someone? I dislike labels. And when I came here, like I said in the beginning, my husband and I, we truly came for the love of the US and I've never regretted coming here. Um, now in Germany, where I was growing up, which was near Stuttgart, there were very few black people, primarily the only black people there were black U.S. soldiers that, you know, there were army uh, army stations there. So during the years when my husband and I came to the United States for business or for vacations, I was always so, I always felt so good because 
black people would greet each other and say hello and I felt like hmm you know I belong that that's something where I belong then when we moved here neither in Michigan nor down here I find it still I, I don't look for it anymore but I found it very hard to make black friends because all of a sudden I was different again. So we had a board meeting at the YWCA and we talked about every day's racism. And there was a, a black doctor lady and she got up and she was very, very emotional. And she said, uh, I look for racism every day and everywhere and I find it all the time. And after a while I said, you know, I don't look for it at all. And I really hardly find it or I'm not finding it. And she looked at me and she said, well, you're different. So I was different again, you know, I'm, I'm different again. And being different today is my identity. I'm who I am. I don't have to belong to the black people. I don't have to belong to the white people or to whatever, just to me. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I think that sentiment, Carmen, um, speaks for the feelings and the journey of many people who today would identify as a Black German. And um, yeah, but I think that over the years, our work together has um, had a lot to do with getting to that point because we see not so much that we've become um, the tight community, for example, that you, Carmen and Gisela and I have, but by seeing mirrors of ourselves and hearing stories of ourselves, are we really that different anymore anyway? So I think well, that's no. one of the important parts of our work to and show that- And one of the great parts. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, looking back all those years, Rose, remember how, how many people we met who were lost or mm -hmm. didn't belong or didn't know. And, you know, to help them along helped me mm -hmm. to become who I am and to have the, no need to belong. And to mm -hmm. me, that that's freedom. Exactly. And I think that's one of the uh, primary strengths of our organization that um, we work towards. So I think that's a great achievement, at least yeah. for us. Or not only that we don't belong, but that we've almost expanded our belongingness. We can belong outside of race, outside of culture, yeah. and create our own senses of belonging. But we had to come along that journey and so we're here, and it's it's remarkable when we see people today that are still at that place. So I guess our work is still important. I think so too, and there are quite a few people. I, I know people like that, and they mm -hmm. not necessarily are Black Germans, but people who, who just have a, a strong need to belong mm -hmm. to an organization or to a party or to something, and they just need to develop themselves first. You have to first be empowered to know, I don't need that, but if I want to be there, I can. Mm -hmm. It's not a need anymore for me or, you know, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you said, that's true freedom. And in a way, we talk a lot about uh, resistance in our classes and just existing as well, our, our buddy Gisela's uh, talk in that same conference, what is it, du bist where du bist, right? Ich bin mm -hmm. where ich bin. Yeah. So, and I think that um, our relationships have strengthened us along the journey to be able to say that confidently, you know? And I think that we found that strength in each other. So in that way, the coming together is still important, but it doesn't have to become... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 not neuropathy. What's the word? I mean, you don't. It, you don't have neurosis. 
something. It doesn't have to become a neurosis where it right. takes a primary position in your life. Exactly. But everybody, but everybody appreciates seeing their their position, their culture, their experience mirrored somewhere else. And just the fact that we exist matters. You you see yourself someplace in the world again. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And and that's why I like our organization that much, Rose, because you know, we help with offering stuff like that, what you do today, um with with all with all the councils that we had in the years before that you all worked on. Um it, it helps people to find their place in life. And I remember of you know so many that shared um Kibina or you know it was so nice mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. to meet all of them and 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 to be together in person also. Um but now for those generations we have hundreds of videos, right? So yeah. you can't go someplace and say, oh, there's no such a thing. Like, you know, when you say that people were shocked because you spoke German, right? Right. Well, now if, if you Google or you go to our website, you see hundreds of yeah. Black Germans. And the remarkable thing, which I think is uh, the core of our work, is that we're telling our own stories in our own way to each other rather than having scholars, researchers, or journalists define us and right. put us in a group as in though we don't again. have our, exactly, as yeah. though we don't have our individual experiences and stories. And I think that's one of the most important things that we do because out of all of those stories we've recorded, none are going to be the same. I mean, they may have some similarities, right? We right, been, right, but nothing is the same. You know, we may have been born in the same area at the same time, have the same or different cultural heritage, but our life experiences are totally different. And, yeah, and just, that's that's something we fight hard because it's very easy for others to define us by the one or two stories that they've read. You yeah, know. And, and I don't want to be defined by others. It's, no. uh, but, you no. know, just look at you and me. You know, I grew up in Germany and I lived there, you know, long, mm -hmm. long, many years. And you grew up here. And, you know, and yet we are both Black Germans and we became mm -hmm. sisters over that, you know. Yeah. That to me is already amazing. Yeah, but our relationship, although it began, along this journey of, of identity, I think our relationship is far beyond oh, yeah. our, our identification. It's who Absolutely. we are as human beings. So I, I think it's a beautiful thing. And I think that we've left a legacy and I'm excited that it's all being archived because yeah, well, we, we, know, we know now that in the beginning, right? In the forties, fifties and sixties, it was an, oddity or we were somewhat you know unique I guess you could say in that space nowadays there's no way it's right. just a normal thing however here in the U.S. for Americans looking at the Germans in the Danzos with the pretzel and oh, yeah. so no, no, they no. would have no idea of the multiculturalism that Germany is today. So today I think it is. that's also important to say, yeah. you know? Today it is. And you know, when when I was in, in Stuttgart last June, I was surprised how many people of color I saw. It it was mm -hmm. just the most normal thing where when I grew up, when I was a little girl, people would go out on a on a walk to see me. So they see a black girl. Yeah. Well, but, you know, there, there were no yeah. others. I, I I knew of no other black children where I grew up. And it took years, I don't know, six, seven, eight years until there was another black boy in our area that, you know, and today it's all different. Yeah, I think though also, um, and, and obviously with me growing up here and you growing up there, but I still think that there are shared experiences that 
people have when they come together. Or sometimes there are things that um, having the same cultural background, or I'll even say you and Gisela can have conversations we know that I don't understand, not That's only right. because of language, but because of experience. And being here and being there, it is nice to have people who share in your experience because you know there are a lot of things and most things that we can be together in a discussion that other people wouldn't understand, but they can be unsaid yeah, by that's us. Right. That's right. You know, I, I, I can imagine, and, and I'll give you an example, a quick example of that, not a long story of it, but uh, the feeling the three of us had on the bus, where were we going to the, um, to the island? Yeah, yeah, in South Carolina. We were still three odd people. Yeah, because in we our were German. <laughs> odd way, you know, and we still stood out from the crowd that, that mm -hmm. was multicultural, right? But that's right. And, but we remember then, and, people even talked to us about it. Uh huh. So, yeah. but there's a comfort and a joy rather than being a negative thing. I think we've also co opted it and we've turned it into something to be proud about and to be. Exactly happy about. So I think that's also something um, in the, uh, we'll put along the theme of resistance, just continuing to find joy and, and ignore all the other stuff, you know, is an act of resistance, right? But that is, and but it's it also speaks to identity roles because, you know, I'm not mad, embarrassed, upset or anything if people call me out and say, oh, you're German. You know, I didn't think you would be German. I think you would be from some islands. Um, to me, it speaks to my identity that I'm not upset about that, that I can easily say, yes, yes, you know, I'm German. And, I, you know, I love to live here in the States. And I think Gisela is the same way. She's, mm -hmm. she's very outspoken about that. Mm-hmm. And politically active in the U.S. Oh, they yeah. let her Gisela would be the president of the U.S. Only none of us can be that, which is something we share, right? None of us share that can too. Have <laughs> office in the United States. I guess I don't even want to be. No, me either. But I guess we better uh, stop our own chit chat and let the students ask a couple more questions before we close. Okay. But it's been fun. I love it. Do we have questions, Emily? I know we do. Just someone has to be brave enough to speak up. Are there some we can read from the <clears throat> emails that um, haven't been asked already since they're being so shy? I can go ahead. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, my camera is not my computer is about to die but uh so i think in the in the panel i know some of the panelists talked about um facing abuse from from skinheads and i wrote a paper for a political science class um about ultra soccer fans i'm like a big soccer guy so i wrote about um ultra fans and how they could be very supportive of racial minorities like in the 2015 immigration wave and stuff like that but also um, how they can be used to kind of spread hate, uh, I guess, like interpersonally, but also on a wider scale in countries um, like in Italy and stuff. And I guess I was just wondering um, if you could speak to maybe just the wider relationship between sports and racism and the social landscape in Germany um, when it comes to like Islamophobia, stuff like that. Benjamin, I am not a... I'm not a football person. I'm not a soccer person. So, but what I read in, you know, I still read German newspapers every day and stuff like that. I think every, I'm not sure, but I say that every team in the Bundesliga has black players. Whether they are, I think most of them come from Africa, I'm not sure. Um, and there is still a certain racism going on, like from the other team members or the, you know, two teams play and the other team members, they make sounds like apes or 
shout out words or stuff like that. So I think there is still something as far as racism going on. However, I really don't know much, of, you know, about the inner ways of how it is within each team. Do they like, you know, do they get along? Do they, I, I don't know anything because um, I'm not very much into who's boss. Yeah, that's okay. I guess a follow-up would be, do you think there's, um, I guess, kind of like sports culture as a whole or fan groups um, have a positive impact on race relations maybe in Germany? Definitely, most definitely, yeah. That's how a lot of Germans learn that there are not only white Germans, but because all of a sudden there are all those sports people, not just in, in football or in soccer, I should say, um, but also in other teams and and they started learning about their culture and learning to say their names and and being open minded and I, I think sports plays a major role in people understanding each other better. Also, out in, in Germany, that's definitely the the case. Great, thank you. Just like culture also, you know, theater or so, but sports plays a major role. Okay, so during the panel and even hearing you talking now, you uh, said in the panel that sharing your story is difficult and rightfully so. But how do you find that the rewards of sharing your story outweigh the difficulties or is there any type of personal reward that you feel you get in return for sharing your difficult stories? I think sharing my story, I'm hoping that I can help somebody who may not be as lucky as I am, who may, may not be as fortunate as I am. You know, I have found my way in life. I've I have a stable, a good life. I have a good company and so on. But I think there are still people out there who are very unsure of themselves and not knowing where they belong and not knowing that they can make it. And by sharing my story, I'm hoping to be able to give somebody the courage to move on, to do something, because you have to be active. Life is not coming to you. You have to be active. You have to go out and, and get it. Regardless whether it's business or private, you have to, you have to do it. And so, um, and I guess that's why I'm, that's the reward for me for sharing my story when I see that other people or other women, because I really concentrate a lot on empowering women, just have made it. And and I don't care if they are, you know, what what race they are. I, just last year, I helped a young woman from Germany um, starting her own business. And this year she's doing fantastic. And to me, that is a reward to tell her, no, you're good, you can do it. You know, there are resources for you. And and I guess that's why I share my story. All right. I've asked someone else if they would like to watch, ask their question. Um, but I don't want to force them to. So I'm going to ask their question for them. Okay, uh, let's see. So after watching the panel from the BGHRA conference, um, my question is how, if at all, has your identity as a black German evolved since the panel through experiences and through movements centered around equal rights, like for example, Black Lives Matter? I asked this question based on her, um, Carmen's response to one of the panel's questions where she discussed her identity as being Carmen first and foremost while also being proud of her Black German identity. So yeah, since 2012, a lot has happened. How has 
I guess your identity shifted or your understanding of your identity and also, um, you know, how you, how you express that. I'm not sure that it shifted a whole lot. I would rather say it got stronger. Um, for me, I'm more and more, I'm totally sure who I am. I'm, I know what I can do. Um, I think this whole, you know, since the time from the panel, I'm, I took so much home with me. I learned so much. I met so many people that were unsure of themselves that I really did a lot for myself to stabilize my identity, to know, just to be sure who I am and what I want. And, you know, sometimes I would even sit down and, and, and do a writing on it. Where do I want to go? You know, how do I want to develop myself? Um, but I also see how important the work of BTHRA is to instill in people the right of their own identity. Have you engaged, this is my question, <clears throat> have you have you read or watched or, you know, engaged with any sort of cultural productions, let's say, broadly from the from Black Germans across the world? Um, first of all, in in general, but also um, any that have resonated with you in your own story. So there's a lot obviously out there. So the most recent or one of the most recent things is Sam Saxon on Hulu, the show mm -hmm. um, about um, uh, Sam and his his story, but um, through the lens, obviously, of a television program. And then uh, there's lots of books out there, memoirs, that sort of thing. I'm just curious if if you engage with that kind of stuff or I guess a broader question is what kind of things do you like to read and watch and that's <laughs> and um I I do read and and you know of, of course I, I I can see all of the German TV here so I get you know get a, a little bit better of a program here. Um yeah and I also saw Sam the Saxon. It did not impress me but you know that's uh I don't engage too much in other organizations than the ones I've, you know, mentioned here. I'm not, I don't even know anybody of Black Lives Matters in my area. Um, I'm sure there are lots of people, but it, it's just not my thing. Uh, I'm, I'm so much more on the positive side. I want people to have you know, success in business. I want women to be empowered. I don't, I'm, I'm not, when you meet Gisela, she's out there at the fences with her. I, I'm not that person. I'm more um, maybe one-on-one -on -one or maybe, you know, one on a few. That's where I prefer to engage because, well, I'm just not the picket fences person. But, you know, to each his own. But that's the beauty of our difference and togetherness, right? Each of us do different things well. But that's all right. the jobs get done. <laughs> that's right. Well, since our students are quiet today, do we have a last question or do you think we can close? I'll have a last question. You've attended our conferences. What have they meant to you? And how is it different to you now that they are online versus in person? Do you miss the in-person conferences? 
we get to see more people on the virtual conferences, but I think the others are more intimate. Which ones do you prefer? I prefer the in-persons. I have met, to include you, of course, Gisela, and so, so many other people that I'm still connected with today, that I learned so much from them. Yeah, it, it's so much easier to be on the Zoom, but you miss out the person. You really miss out the person. And to me, you know, what, what we have done or what really you have done with all those conferences is awesome. It's just so, so good. And you did so much good with, you know, putting people together, putting panels together and help people learn that not only there are black Germans. Remember when that one lady said, I'm a black Danish person, can I come? Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> it, it almost made me cry because you know, she was so like, I'm the only Danish person in that whole Danish black person in that whole world. And to this day, I'm in contact with her. Wonderful. And so to me, yeah, that's a wonderful thing. And I like in person because, yeah, because of the personal relationship, yeah. I would say. I mean, me so too. it's fine, but yeah. If and it's always to... our personal party, right? When we it's get right. together, it's, right. uh, it's like a reunion after a while. Yeah. But you know, if if you want to put one on, I promise to help. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> 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 I'll hold you to that. But in so in closing, now I'd like to express my profound appreciation to Mrs. Carmen Geshka, Dr. Emily Fraser Rath, and importantly, to Davidson College for making this and so many other conversations possible over the last three years. I must also acknowledge our brilliant students of whom we couldn't be prouder, and I'm sure they'll get a little less shy as time goes on. Today's recording will be soon uploaded on our YouTube channel at Black German. Please subscribe and turn on the notifications so that you will be notified as soon as new recordings are added. Visit our website at bghra.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Eventbrite for details about other upcoming events and our annual virtual conference, which is coming up from the 22nd to the 24th of this month. Registration is now open and our conferences are always free and open to the public. We hope that you will consider joining us as well as you enjoyed today's conversation. So until next time, thank you again for your time and attention. It was an honor to be with you. I thoroughly enjoyed my time with everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Guten Tag. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.